All right, so I see a lot of familiar names. We've got 24 participants. I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, a couple of people still might be logging on, but I wanted to welcome everybody to our first, um, first edition of the fall 2021 research seminar series for the Institute of Exercise Physiology and Rehab Science. If you've seen the flyer, we've got four really outstanding guests um, that were handpicked that we're all really excited about and we're very grateful that they're willing to share their knowledge and background information with all of us. Um, everyone has agreed that these are open, um, so we are recording as well. Uh, but please, for those of you that are UCF students and friends, uh, please feel free to spread the word. We have four more of these on various Fridays. Uh, two more of them are at one, and then the last one is going to be um, at noon. Um, so the format of this is Dr. Fraser has a talk for us. Then what we like to do is kind of have a general content-related Q&A, so questions about the talk. And then... Uh, what Dr. Mangum and I thought might be kind of fun to do would be for all of us faculty members to get off <laughs> and to have um, sort of student time with Dr. Frazier, where maybe the talk then could be Q&A can kind of be related more to professional topics, professional development, life as a grad student, um, next steps, kind of whatever it is you all want to talk about. But we're all aware, at least I'm aware with my students that the dynamic changes when I'm not there. <laughs> so <laughs> the members will log off and it'll just be um, Q&A with the students and Dr. Frazier only. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to my friend, Dr. Mangum, who's going to introduce our speaker. We're sharing a computer. <laughs> sure to make things maybe easier. Not have the crazy Zoom echo that sometimes happens when you don't meet fast enough. Um, well, thanks everybody for being here and especially to Dr. Frazier. Um, I'll go through the traditional bio and then I'll add a few things on for how I know um, Dr. Frazier. Um, so John Frazier um, is a board orthopedic physical therapist, scientist and leader in the United States Navy currently serving as the Deputy Director for Operational Readiness and Health at the Naval Health Research Center in San Diego, California. Dr. Frazier is a graduate of the Physical Therapy Program at the College of Staten Island City University of New York in 2002, and the Post-Professional DPT Program at the University of St. Augustine for Health Sciences in 2018. He converted the PhD in Education, Kinesiology, Sports Medicine, from the University of Virginia in 2017, where he studied the role of the foot in lateral ankle sprains and chronic ankle instability. Dr. Frazier's specialized clinical experience includes the prevention, primary care, and rehabilitation of tactical, collegiate, and recreational athletes with neuromuscular skeletal injuries in traditional clinical settings and austere expeditionary environments. His research interests and scholarship are concentrated on ankle, foot, neuromusculoskeletal function, rehabilitation, and public health of military tactical athletes. Um, his experience includes leadership of interdisciplinary teams, clinical practice, and medical and operational planning, and teaching in graduate professional and medical education. And um, Dr. Frazier and I were at the University of Virginia together. We actually started the PhD program, um, went through all of our coursework together, and really supported one another <laughs> through mm -hmm. the entire process. Um, and I think built a lifetime lasting um, friendship and relationship as colleagues and can truly trust one another, both in the research lab and just with life advice too. So I'm excited for him to be here to share what he does, his wealth of knowledge, um, and all things military medical research. Um, but please feel free to pick his brain about all things. And if you have a foot and ankle question, he will absolutely answer it. <laughs> Definitely throw those in there 
forum too. Um, so without further ado, I'll let Dr. Frazier take it over. Great, thank you very much. And, and first of all, th thank you uh, for inviting me to uh, talk to your, uh, to your uh, faculty and students. Um, so it's my understanding that we have both uh, athletic training, PT and exercise phys, is, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Great, because I, I think everything I'm gonna be talking about is contextualized in, in those, you know, from a warfighter performance perspective, which is, you know, the, from a physical, cognitive, psychological performance perspective, as well as the injury prevention and mitigation, you know, the rehabilitation missions. So I, I think, uh, I think what, who, you know, based on the, the framework of the talk, um, I think it's gonna be applicable to everybody. So today I'm gonna be talking about military medical research and how we could optimize, you know, warfight performance and readiness. And we'll, we'll talk about what that means through both science and partnership, okay? Um, so just as a, uh, you know, just, so I'm, I'm currently at Naval Health Research Center and I'm actually making my transition. I'll be joining the faculty down at uh, Army Baylor in January. So there's lots, lots of moves. And I think that will be my last tour in the, uh, my last uh, place in the Navy. So more to follow. All right, so because I'm a commander in the United States Navy, uh, my disclosures that everything I'm presenting today are my opinions. Um, and mine alone, and it may or may not be representative of the government, okay? And I don't have any other conflicts of interest to report. All right, I figured we would start on a very light topic. And, and what you're looking at right here is the science and technology acquisition pipeline in the Department of Defense. And you're probably saying, why am I showing this? It's very complicated and you have like missiles and a CWIS, you know, a closing weapon system on the right-hand side. And, what the heck does that have to do with anything I'm talking about? Well, this is the way, you know, this pipeline and this, this basically development um, is, is how s and really developed in the, in the military uh, circles and it evolved to what it is today. Where on the left hand of the side is looking at the requirements and building breadboards for a circuit board all the way to the right for the procurement of intercontinental ballistic missiles, right? And as part of that, there is a RDT. &E. Oh, by the way, I, so just as another disclaimer, I am from New York. Um, if, if I say something you don't understand, stop me. I figure since you guys are in Florida, there's enough New Yorkers you guys are probably fluent by now. Um, but the other thing is I, I speak in corporate speak. So I use a lot of uh, militaries, right? You know, um, so if there's an acronym I throw out and it's not clear, please just stop me. So, or, you know, just shoot something in the, uh, in the chat so I could answer that. So, so for the s and science and technology pipeline, um, you'll see that research development, test and evaluation, rdt &E, is a big part of that. And like I said, it's traditionally been used for procurement of weapon systems. However, you know, th this is actually was in the, uh, um, United States Navy uh, Institute News, where they talked about the Valkyrie program, which is essentially walking blood bank. And we're actually, uh, some of my teams are actually performing on that, on the test and evaluation of that, you know, in cold weather in you know, different areas. So this is a prime example of, you know, s and that applies to the medical, to the medical uh, applications. So, I'm going to back everybody up. And, and the way I frame this talk is I'm going to start broad. It's, and I, I warned uh, Dr. Mangum, uh, I'm going to give a little bit of a civics lecture uh, because it's pertinent and salient to, to, you know, what we're talking about. So essentially the way, the way, you know, DOD funding works is that you actually have, you know, military is a, uh, one of the applications in, in addition to diplomacy, intelligence, and economic uh, powers as we as we project power uh, across, you know around the around the globe and and protect our national interests you know and in doing so you know we actually formulate um, our requirements based on that guidance and I'm gonna I'm gonna delve a little bit deeper into that you know by doing so once those requirements you know where there's a dialogue between our our uh, civilian um, leadership you know the president the net the secretary of defense um, and, and the National Security Advisor, right, which formed the National Security Council, okay, they, you know, the military leaders 
and and the um, and the executive uh, ex executive branch of the, of the government talk and say, all right, this is what we what we would like to accomplish. The military leaders say, okay, this is what we need in order to to meet that end state. And so a budget, the, the president prepares a budget. However, the, the president, because of the division of powers, that budget needs to go to Congress for, for resolution, which, which basically they, they look at it, they amend it, you know, um, they actually record, they actually have their, uh, whether there's uh, based on the wants and needs of Congress as well. And then that final, that final law gets passed as the National Defense Authorization Act, which, which then funds the military, including research and development. I'll talk about that further in the, uh, the talk. So that's kind of like a, a broad overview of, of, of governance and how that winds up, you know, you know with money that's available for, for DOD research. So the National Defense Strategy is, is, is put out every, every few years, okay, or it's released every few years. That, and it basically they talk about the, the, I mean, this is really 30,000 foot view requirements. And, and you're going you're gonna to keep on, there's going to be, there's gonna be an ongoing theme about requirements driven research. And what we'll get to, well, I'll marry that topic up later on. But the National Defense Strategy is really the 30,000 foot view of what we're trying to accomplish as, as a uh, government in the protection of the homeland, as well as protection of our natural interests and, and protection of our natural interests. Uh, around the world. From there, you know, they work with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which, which basically is the, uh, the, the interaction between the military and the executive branch, right? Uh, you know, pertaining to the president and the, uh, not, and the Secretary of Defense. So the Joint Chiefs of Staff even take what the, the, the national uh, security strategy, and then they basically contextualize it and start putting it. And you'll notice that these aims are starting to funnel down into more direct, you know, a little bit more direct goals. So you're going to see, like, sustain our values, imp improve joint warfighting readiness. You're going to see this term over and over. Now, that could be mature readiness, you know. So do we have the equipment, the ships, the, the, uh, the you know, um, munitions that are required to fight the next fight? Um, our, you know, medical readiness is a vitally important piece of this. Medical readiness is, are our folks ready to deploy and to go into harm's way without having to worry about, I don't know, low back pain or anti or anterior knee pain or an ACL tear? So, so from that perspective, so that's, you know, so improve, uh, improve joint uh, warfighting readiness. And then, of course, there's that future development. Now, you know, and I'm thinking about more of the warfighter performance perspective, you know, are we able to get our folks, you know, A, equip them correctly? Are we able to provide the knowledge, skills, and abilities for them to execute the task at hand? You know, and can we take those knowledge, skills, and abilities and improve their ability and execution? So that way, it, you know, we actually have a more capable force. So, and then I, I want to also point out to the last aim, where it says, take care of our people and our families. And that's from a medical perspective, that's from a social perspective, psychological perspective, you know, environmental perspective. You know, if you think about like all the, the, the factors that drive health-related quality of life, you know, I'm, not, I'm gonna apply something that's salient to us, right? From a health-related quality of life, you know, those intrinsic and environmental factors that mediate function and outcomes. Funneling down and, and you know, I, I'm, a, I'm in the United States Navy. I'm going to give you the Navy Marine Corps perspective on this. The Army and the Air Force will also have their guidance. I did not go into this. Um, but this is from the Chief of Naval Oper uh, Operation and, and his naval plan in order to meet what the Joint Chiefs are looking for, as well as the National Security Strategy. And so... The CNO interpreted that we need to be able to project power. We need to have the capabilities, the capacity to do that. And, and the most important, you'll see a, a uh, ongoing narrative, is the people are the most important part of the organization um, and making sure that they're, they're ready to do that. So we're growing as a, as a Navy. Um, and it's simply, you know, because sea lanes of communication and our ability to project power from the littorals, meaning from the water to about 100 miles inland, the majority of the world populace live in those littorals. 
So I think from that perspective, you know, our ability to do that is is a is a major keystone of 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 our ability to project, you know, to protect our national security. This is the so for those uh, who who didn't know before, you will know now that the Marine Corps is actually part of the Department of Navy, um, and and so from the 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 Commandant of the Marine Corps also puts out his planning guidance. And you'll see a lot of the same overlaps, but now we're contextualizing to Marines, basically reshaping how they're conducting warfare, you know, our ability, the knowledge, skills, abilities, education, training required to meet those end states, you know, making sure that the core values of honor, courage, and commitment are upheld. And that translates into many different, um, in the, in, especially in the psychological and social uh, avenues and how that applies. And of course, command and leadership. And we also know that, you know, uh, industrial and organizational psychology is very important, how an organization functions from a leadership and how we motivate folks to do something that is something oftentimes unpleasant in, in a austere and, and hostile environment, right? So all those factors, you know, are gonna be, you know, play a role. Um, and once again, I'm highlighting pieces where I think you'll see things that are in our realm, in the healthcare realm, in the exercise physiology realm, the performance realm, are, are, could play a, a vital piece. Now we're going to get into um, Navy medicine. And, and Navy medicine is the primary uh, medical providers for both the Navy and the Marine Corps. We're as much part of the, as the Fleet Marine Force, the, the Marines as we are a part of the fleet Navy. So, you know, there are a couple uh, different focuses that, that the uh, Surgeon General of the Navy has focused on, specifically the people, the platforms we serve, our ability to execute, you know, our medical mission, both in CONUS, like in, in continental United States, in a military treatment facility, hospital clinic, as well as in austere environments, like in the middle of the desert. Um, as well as our ability to project power. And I, I really like the picture that it, they included. They have an aircraft carrier and then they have the hospital ship where the aircraft carrier is a example of projection of hard power. And, you know, you know a, lot of a lot of countries will start complying with, 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 uh, with our interests when you park a aircraft carrier off their coast. However, I think the, the Whitehall, the, the, the hospital ship, also has been shown to have effects from a soft power perspective, more from the diplomacy, like after humanitarian assistance, uh, after a disaster, uh, or providing, you know, providing disaster relief. Um, so I think from that mission set, you know, Navy medicine has a, a, has a pivotal role in, A, number one, maintaining the health readiness uh, of the fleet. And, and we do that through our partnerships. We do that partnerships within you know, within the Department of Defense, with other branches, as well as our civilian collaborators. And, and that's one of the reasons I'm talking to you guys today. So I'm, I'm gonna just back up a little bit because now we're gonna start getting a little bit into the nuts and bolts. So we, we talked about requirements driven and capabilities that we need to maintain in order for, for national security, right? Now we're gonna talk about that more, the power of the purse, right? And Congress, you know, the, the, the executive branch, the president and the secretary of defense and the, remember the Department of Defense is part of the executive branch, you know, could do, want to do a lot of things. And if Congress doesn't like it, they just defund it, right? And that's why they have the power of the purse. And that's, that's part of that division of power that, uh, that our government has set up, with, which is a great system that the founders set up. So... I think it's important to kind of contextualize it because it's also going to drive the nuts and bolts of how we execute research money. All right. So these are different types of appropriations. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to be the acronym uh, translator for you. So rdt &E, which you, you've heard before, because uh, I mentioned about five times already, research, development, test, and evaluation. And this is, remember, all funding has a has a life expectancy. They will appropriate it and it will be good for that time frame only. And at that point, it, dissip it dissipates into the ether. It actually goes back to the, uh, it goes back to the coffers, uh, to the treasury. So rdt &E, uh, is incrementally funded and that provides some flexibility. We'll talk about that in a slide or two with a two year uh, lifespan. 
and and I'll, I'll I'll talk about you know when we're talking about some of these when we have civilian performers, you know once it's written off the government's books, it it turns into multi-year money, like five-year money or or whatnot, uh, and it's all dependent on the on the color. You, you'll keep on you'll hear me talk about the colors of money because you know you can't use RDT and E. I'll give you an example. So on the bottom here is MILCON, which is military construction. I can't use rdt and &E funding, which I'm fat on, to fund my sleep, my sleep uh, laboratory renovation because it's a different, different appropriation. And it's actually illegal to misappropriate money, right? So you can't do that. Um, but for, the, for your purposes, the rdt and &E is what you typically will see uh, these calls being funded by. The other one that you see that you should be aware of, especially if you're partnering with a military laboratory, is O&M, which means it stands for Operation and Management Dollars. And that's you know before I joined, uh, crossed over to the science and technology side, you know, and that's when I met Dr. Mangum. You know, I functioned off of O&M uh, for for 14 years, and then after I finished defending my doctorate and went to you know, I had to learn how the RDT and E side of the house worked because it was very different. So every once in a while, you'll see O&M, and if you're partnering with a military partner, now O&M cannot be used for research. However, it could be used for like more process improvement type projects. Um, and, and there are discrete and distinct differences. Oftentimes you could answer a question using a, you know, a process improvement approach by a, you know, using systematic investigation to derive generalizable knowledge research, right? You know, so if that application does not apply, you know, to the O&M, then, you know, once again, it's, it, it needs to be some vetting, but every once in a while, you'll, you'll hear a military partner talking about that appropriation, O&M funding. As I mentioned earlier, rdt and &E is incremental. Um, and typically has a two-year life expectancy. And this was designed, you know, and that's when you're actually talking about, you know, when it's a military performer's functioning as the primary on this money. Or, for example, let's say, um, let's say Dr. Mango and I go put in a proposal together and we, we get funded, hooray, right? Now, the, the government will cut a check to UCF to execute, and they'll cut a check to um, to the government laboratory. That that government laboratory needs to basically appropriate and expend that funding before it expires, or else it disappears into the ether. Um, and, and there's mechanisms on how we do that, especially leveraging our, our contracts, you know, for execution of the research mission. Um, talking about from uh, the UCF, that same money will be good for five years. So, you know, pertaining to budgeting, that's something that, you know, it's, it's just something to kind of keep in the back of your mind. Now, and this is, this is a very, very important slide because inside the calls, they will mention the, the color of money. Not only will they define the scope of the call and what the intended purpose of the, of the, of the research call is, but you'll also see you know, six one, six six two, six five, right? Those are pertaining to the levels of research. Okay, so it is a really bad idea to apply to a six one call. Okay, if it's more applied research, you just don't do it. I mean, they'll they'll just you know at the pre proposal phase you'll, you'll wash out. Okay, so I and you know, there's actually cross talks uh, from the Office of Management and Budget which on the left-hand side, many of the terms that you're already familiar with, and if, as well as the national uh, NSF's uh, definition of, of the different levels of research. And that ranges the scope from applied research to experimental design, and then of course, reallocate, reallocating or re, uh, appro not appropriating, re taking research findings and perhaps investigating a different population with the same tech. So it's reapplication of established technology or, or knowledge towards a new research question, which, which oftentimes will have that, that component of it. And, and this is actually reflects the, the transition, you know, well, that first slide, that big complicated slide, 
of the continuum of S and T uh, management. So I'm going to talk a little bit about CDMRP, which is Congressionally Directed Medical Research Programs. Every year they'll have a call, um, and the call uh, ranges from everything from alcohol and substance abuse to you know, traumatic brain injury and psychological health, which, by the way, uh, the call is open. The pre call for pre-proposals is due uh, in a few weeks. Um, so CDMRP is a congressional uh, special interest. Remember I told you um, that this is CDMRP is funded under the uh, DOD funding, but it, it's, not, it, it's not in the budget that's submitted by the Secretary of Defense to Congress uh, for, for, uh, for funding. So this is actually one of those special interests that I talked about. And it ranges the gamut, you know, on the scope and context. And then even within, and I'll, I'll talk about, and I, it's a better uh, illustrated in the, next, in the next couple of slides, where even within traumatic brain injury, the scope and the context of that funding uh, will differ depending on the call. And there's typically three to four calls underneath that, that category. Uh, and these come out every every uh, couple of years or so. Actually, every year there's some there's some uh, that actually come out every year, and then others like come and go, uh, come and go. Um, as you can see on here, there's no musculoskeletal, whereas musculoskeletal has been there on in the past. So this is the current CDMRP funding. Talking about a little bit about programming cycle, and I'm, I'm going to contextualize the requirements uh, driven and and. This is a little bit more applied of, of how it can, how it fits in to the life cycle of, of, of DOD funding. So we talked about the appropriation. I'm not going to beat that up uh, any further. So typically you'll have a stakeholders meeting and the stakeholders meeting are comprised of uh, line, line um, like officers enlisted that are in the operational naval forces or the operational Marine Corps. Okay, you'll have healthcare providers, you'll have scientists that have been funded before in the past, you'll have other subject matter experts that invite to the stakeholders meeting, where they actually help to define what are the current requirements and what are the what are the current problems facing, I don't know, Navy medicine or Army medicine, or you know, or the fleet, the operational forces from a from the warfighter performance perspective. From there, that's contextualized. They develop a vision, okay? And what they essentially do at that point is then they, they promulgate and push their funding opportunities, you know, and that is advertised in a call, like what I was just showing you earlier. So from those funding opportunities, you put in a pre-application. Pre-applications range everything from a one letter, uh, a one page letter of intent, uh, all the way up, and uh, you know, typically they're about five pages long, where you're basically contextualizing what you want to do. Um, and it's within abbreviated methods, with your intended population, what partners, as well as the translation at the end, like what, what, is, what is the bang? And this is important that you actually have all your ducks in the row at this point, because the biggest way to failure is not including all the pieces at the step, right, that they're asking for. You know, and they're gonna see if it's appropriate. Does it fit the call? Does it fit the color of money? Does it fit, you know, does it result in, in what you say is, you know, does it meet an intended end state? From there, they're screened. And then, so right, congratulations. You got an invitation to submit a full proposal. And these are much more extensive, um, you know, extensive proposals. Um, now, I think it's very important um, if you're thinking of, and you could look at historically what's been, what's been provided before, I think it's really important to look at what they've funded before, what their previous requirements, and if you have a research question, start early thinking about and, and maybe start to flesh out the experimental design or, you know, the methodology on, on whatever design you're intending to use and have that in your back pocket because, you know, oftentimes it is a, you have a scant amount of time you know, oftentimes it's, there's an adequate, you know, to put a comprehensive full proposal together, but it's it's often helpful to have sometimes these, you know, whether it's a previously unfunded um, proposal or or something that you're actually generating throughout the year, you know, to start thinking about having that in your hip pocket, you know, for when these calls and then applying it 
to what the question is that they're looking for. From there, you submit it in, make sure everything is complete. It goes through a peer review process, which you know, no different than if you're sending in your manuscripts, they are gonna scrutinize and rank your, the scientific scrutiny of what you're trying to accomplish, as well as the feasibility. And these are typically scientists that are doing this peer review. Um, so that's, so they, they rank it, they rack and stack, and now they actually, you go to, it goes from there to the programmatic review. So I remember I talked about all the stakeholders that we, that, that you know, helped to formulate. Well, a lot of those same individuals or, or different individuals that have a, a stake in the game, patient, po you know, representatives from the patient population, from clinicians, from the line, uh, you know, I think at that point, other scientists, you know, policymakers, um, anybody who has a stake in the, in the game, you know, or oftentimes uh, invited to review proposals at this stage. And so they'll have the scores from the scientific scrutiny already, and then it goes to the programmatic review. Um, from there, they will, they will provide a fund of recommendations, which then get forwarded to the commanding. So CDMRP is executed by the Army. Uh, it's a command called USAMDRA, which is a uh, United States Army Material Development and Research uh, Command, or I think I have that correct. But USAMDRA, this, the commanding general will, will review it, you know, review the complete packages, you know, and approve it. Then when, that's when you get that letter that says, congratulations, you've been recommended for funding, which is great. And that's where the um, negotiations between the program managers for the, um, for the awards and you go back and forth and smoothing out the wrinkles of the budget and the execution. And sometimes the program managers are aware of, of something else that, that they'll ask you to integrate into your, uh, into your research. Um, to answer a related question that they're perhaps trying to answer. Um, and that's all done in the, in the negotiation phase. Then you get cut the check. Congratulations, you got funded. Now it's up to you to execute. And mind you, you know, you're on a timeline, all right? You're, you're on, a, uh, on a timeline to execute in that, in that period of performance. So this is vitally important because now they've vetted I, you know, it's, it, it does not bode well if you say you're able to do something, you're not able to execute, whether you don't have the partnership set up. Um, I'm, I'm telling you, plan early to, to get at least the uh, regulatory pieces done, you know, uh, to get the RIB proposals done, uh, because that is a, I mean, sometimes they're protracted periods, um, as, as you guys know, when, you know, and you guys know your RIB better than others, but there's also a second level called the HARPO review, a uh, human research protections uh, office review, which then looks at the, your IRB, they look at their pieces, and then they may ask for additional uh, requirements at that point. If you want to do work with the Marine Corps, you're gonna need a general letter, of, a, a commanding general letter of support. So, you know, a lot of those things are taking part in, in this, and, and hopefully you have that already done a priori. Then, what they at that point we're up to research outcomes, and you'll actually have stakeholders meetings. Um, I'm, I'm rather not stakeholders uh, program review um, um, panels where you'll present incremental findings, your status, how you're keeping up with uh, your intended uh, end states for each of your aims. Um, you got to present to increment. You know, if there's if you have earlier aims that are complete, you're able to present that or you know, uh, preliminary findings. Get it, always get people excited about your work. And that's also an opportunity at that point where you start meeting other performers, uh, which lend itself uh, you know, to the network and the social aspects. And then the last part is the dissemination phase. And I'm gonna talk about that uh, a little bit more specifically. This is a uh, EBRAT and so, this is one, uh, from, at least from the DOD side, this is where we're able to access all the different calls, with, whether that's an intramural call, uh, meaning that's specifically for uh, DOD laboratories only, or an extramural call, which is all comers could, could apply for that funding. Um, now, I think it's an interesting, uh, it's a caveat where, you know, let's say UCF and, and NHRC partnership up. 
and and there's an intramural call that doesn't preclude you know UCF executing the NHRC as the government laboratory would have to be the primary executor on the uh the, the PI would have to fall uh to the government lab um this is grants.gov this is the, this is actually the public facing um site where you'll actually have um all the respective calls so knowing that the we have the current call for uh concussion related research and and psychological I put in traumatic brain injury, and this is what populated. And you'll see within the, the same call, which are due on the on pretty much the same, uh, well, they actually have different uh, closeout dates. You know, many of them will be the same. This is actually an abbreviated one. Uh, yeah, right here. So you'll have the like the September calls, but you, you have this larger grant right here where it, it will actually be due in December. So you have to be cognizant of, of when they're due you know, what the mechanism, and that's how you're able to pull up the call. And, and once again, you're going to hear me say this multiple times because I want to hammer it home. Read the call in its entirety. I, I think it's very important to see if what you're trying to accomplish meets what, they're, what, they, what the intent is. So now that I got you excited, okay, about DOD funding, and now you want to potentially apply, let's, let's talk about how you maximize your chances as, as a as an academic institution. A number one, read the call. I mean, if you remember nothing else, you know, read the call, all right, and, and read it in entirety. Um, I, I think that's very important. The second thing, I mean, this is like common sense stuff. It's like the things we tell our students, read the directions, okay, and follow them, all right? I think, you know, there's no quicker way to be, you know, on the cutting block at the pre-proposal phase if you don't have all your ducks in the row and you don't provide them the, the information that they requested, okay? And I think a, a big, a, a, a fairly common mistake is make sure your research question that you intend to ask, truly, I mean, you have to be an honest broker. Does it meet the intent of the call? Don't be applying for basic research, you know, funding if it's applied. I mean, that's, that's another way to, to uh, you know, cut your legs out from underneath you. I think this is the, but remember you talked about, we talked about earlier about requirements driven research. Make sure that your research that you're planning is going to align with a capability gap, you know, and it's going to fill a potential requirement. So I think there's, there's ways that where you could actually take, let's say you wanted to examine, I don't know, ultrasound and low back pain. Great. All right. That's, uh, it's an important question from a clinical perspective, but you know, how does it apply to our current gaps in the military medicine? How does that apply, you know, to our ability to manage patients when they're in an austere environment? Well, I mean, that's easy, right? You know, because, you know, a butterfly, you know, ultrasound is small, it's portable, you can fit it in your, in your, uh, in your medical pack. Oh, and by the way, it provides you with the visualization of what's going on using a, a, a smartphone, you know, and a, you know, and, and a portable ultrasound device that's fairly durable. So I, I, I just use that as an example, um, because I think from that perspective, you're now contextualizing what you want to do, but you're putting in a framework that fits a, fits a military requirement. Now, I think this is, and a lot of this is common sense for most of, most of folks out there, but I need to say, can you employ sound methodology to, to ensure internal validity. Because, you know, oh, and then the other piece is that, are you able to do it? Is it feasible to do it in the period of performance, right? Because if, if it's not methodological sound, you know, um, we, we can't rely on those findings, right? We can't, that, that, that's not gonna result in, uh, you know, in, in, you know, valid, you know, a valid measure, or it, it's, it's not gonna rely, we, we can't use that, right? Um, Will you be able to recruit from a population? So now we're switching from internal validity to external validity. Are you going to be able to recruit from a population that will ensure external validity? And if you're talking about something more basic, I don't know, um, I'm going to use a knee example, right? A knee in a, in a young adult, you know, with or without injury may look, you know, fairly similar, right? And it's a real, little bit more on parent level, right? Uh, type research. Now, 
the experiences, the cultures. Now, if you're thinking about talking about compliance, something that's affected by intrinsic or environmental factors, which in many cases they are. Okay, the external validity in a university, you know, aged, you know, young adult may not be the same as somebody who's been, you know, he's 21 years old and he's been schlepping, you know, uh, 100 pound packs, you know, in the desert, you know, it, just based on the, or managing a million dollar piece of equipment, right? So I think, you know, from that perspective, I think it's helpful to, you know, to keep that in mind. Um, if you have a ROTC unit, which I know you do from, from conversations with Dr. Mangum, you know, employing a ROTC because, you know, those are college, you know, college, uh, you know, college students that are now, they're, they're actually um, con contracted, you know, um, to not only do their academics, but to also do their military requirements while in college, and then their commission at the tail end, you know, so from that perspective, you know, is it the military population? No, but it's closer than your standard, you know, your standard college, uh, college aged individual, right, in many cases. So I think, you know, it, you know, leveraging some of the resources that you have, and then we'll talk about like, you know, uh, you know, how we could, how you could also improve, right? Now, from a, from a translation perspective, now the priorities in academia, especially as a told, you know, I have a H index uh, plot up here, right? Where dissemination and peer reviewed and, um, and, and professional conferences, I think is important, right? I, I really do think is important. And the DOD, I think also, views it as important, but not, they don't prioritize it the way academia does. And doing that in itself is not enough of a return on investment uh, to fill those capability gaps. So, you know, now as a taxpayer, doll, as a taxpayer, I think it's, I think it's imperative that we disseminate, you know, government, government, uh, government um, funded uh, uh, research and making sure, making sure that it's open access and we get that out just from a, you know, from, as a taxpayer and a, as a clinician scientist, I want that, right? But the line is, you know, or the medical, the folks in the medical trenches, they need something a little bit more tangible. So, and I, I, I parse this up into both knowledge products as well as technology um, development. And I talked about earlier on about um, procurement of weapon systems, right? That you know, from the bread box to something tangible. Well, it could also be an ankle brace. So I'll give you an example. We, we, we actually just submitted uh, our patent application. I partnered up with uh, UCSD Engineering and we're developing the next generation ankle brace using smart materials, you know. So that's one example of hardware development as an, as an end state. You know, are you doing something that in the end will, will uh, culminate in something tangible? Software development, you know, applications for smartphones, you know, I think is, is, a, is a prime example. You know, is, you know, are you gonna develop a web app or a, um, a you know, phone-based application that could be applied, you know, not only to your research, but could be translated to the government? Oh, and mind you, you could still, you know, patent it. You could actually have a proprietary if it's government funded. Now the government gets that gets licensed gets basically free license to use that technology, you know, um, if it's DOD funded, right? But you could still sell it, you know, to other folks, right? So I mean, I would I would talk to you know talk to the uh, the the uh, tech transfer folks in order to get the the, the skinny on that, you know. This, but so that's from the technology side. But we, a lot of times, as clinician scientists, right, we we oftentimes will develop knowledge products, right, and that's something tangible you know, uh, that the clinicians could take back or the patients could take back, you know, developing clinician education materials at the end of your, uh, at the end of your research uh, project. Patient education materials is always a great idea, right? Something that could explain how to do it, you know, any videos that you develop. And that's immediately translatable and useful in the clinical trenches. And then of course, from a policy perspective or, or a more macro practice or policy pr perspective, you know, development of white papers that have a, a, an executive summary, you know, written in plain English, I think is helpful when you're trying to inform, you know, larger level policy uh, decisions. Um, so even like, you know, white papers in itself, 
it's it's a little it's related but discreet from from your typical uh, journal submission. So I'm going to get to the part where we talked about partnership, and and I, I'm going to tell you like so like when I for the longest time I was dual hatted. I was leading the uh, warfighter performance department and and as well as doing the deputy director uh, position. Um, and I, I, I've recently turned over the department uh, to my relief. Um, and inside, you know, I used to always say, you know, in, in my department, I had everything from cognitive psychologists, IO psychologists, um, you know, your, your tip, your behavioral, your behavioral psychologists. Um, I had exercise physiologists, dietitian, exercise, uh, let's see, exercise phys, sleep physiologists, um, biomedical engineers, I have programmers. So we had a wide, you know, diversity, you know, so wide, wide breadth, but not a lot of depth. And what we do is we partner with our academic partners of the DOD labs to build that depth in, into the research team as we're tackling. So by, by, you know, and I think it's mutually beneficial, you know, when you have a military lab working with an academic uh, laboratory and vice versa, you guys definitely will derive benefit as well. So A number one, you know, the benefit that you guys get is that we could actually contextualize what the military, what's keeping the military leaders up at night. You know, we, ha we are, have the pulse on what are the requirements, what are the problem sets, what are folks having? Uh, and we actually are talking to, whether that be the clinicians or the warfighters, you know, to, you know, what are their problem sets? You know, in addition to that broader guidance that I presented earlier in the presentation. Um, we have access to military populations. So talking about that external validity piece. And, you know, the beauty thing about functioning with a collegiate, you know, a collegiate population and with the military population is that that's another, another factor that you could evaluate. You know, if there is a uh, delta between those two populations, because that I think that in, when you're trying to derive truth and knowledge, right, that is, I think it's an important contextualizing factor to kind of think about. Um, development of knowledge products and policy recommendations that matter, right, and that are translatable. So, you know, there's a lot of good ideas floating out there, and, and there's maybe a, a proportion of those ideas that are actually feasible and actionable. You know, so we able to provide, you know, before I, I cross over, I told you earlier, you know, before crossing over to the ST side, I was deployed, I was ship's company on the enterprise the aircraft carry. I deployed with the new. Um, so we're able to take those, those um, you know, what we want to accomplish and frame it in a way um, that actually, you know, meets, meets an end state and intent that matters to the DOD. Um, we have the networks uh, for required for dissemination, whether that be back to the stakeholders um, or, you know, a little bit more macro, you know, in the joint environment, you know, knowing the special leaders of the other, you know, in the, you know, of physical therapy, sports medicine, uh, orthopedic surgery in the other branches that in the Army, uh, Air Force. So we actually have mechanisms where we're able to, to get that content out and disseminate it widely in the military health system, as well as for the operational fleet. Um, we actually have reputations, you know, as reliable performers by many of the portfolio managers and funding circles. And, and that will, will definitely be a uh, lend itself to, uh, you know, a greater uh, propensity for funding. Uh, especially if there's somebody on there that has has a reputation, and this is especially true if you're new to the uh, new to the DoD uh, application. Uh, you know, in addition to what you've been doing on the civilian side, you know, that you'll actually have uh, you know reliable partners that have have a reputation as being uh, being able to execute. Um, I think that's helpful. Access to intramural funding, and we talked about that early. Um, so there's certain intramural funding calls where the DOD has to be the lead, like I said, that does not necessarily preclude um, you know, our civilian partners to, to be a part of that uh, in, in joint calls. And then lastly, and this is something as a military officer that you know, I pride myself on, and I'm a pretty fiscally conservative guy, is making sure that the taxpayer dollars are going to something that is relevant and something that's going to count. And, I, and this is being iterated, you know, throughout the application process, because I think many of us, whether you're, whether you're a government civilian or a military member, 
um, they pride ourselves because we have to be good stewards of the of the taxpayers that we're paying. And you know, I pay taxes like the rest of you guys. Um, and I want to make sure that that's going to some something that's going to be salient um, and that's going to matter. So this is just a overview. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the DoD labs, uh, specifically the ones in uh, Navy Medicine. So we fall under the Bureau of Medicine and Surgery under uh, the section called Navy Medicine West, which is out here in San Diego. However, Navy Medicine West has uh, is our uh, immediate superior. Um, it's our higher headquarters for all the, uh, the all the Navy Medicine labs throughout the world. And that includes Naval uh, Medical Research uh, and Development, um, Naval Medical uh, Research Center in Silver Springs. Um, you have NHRC, which is where I'm at right now at, in San Diego. Uh, NAMRU Dayton, who does a lot more aerospace, but they do a wide variety of other uh, health-related type research. Um, you have Naval uh, Submarine uh, Medical Research Laboratory up in Broughton. NAMRU San Antonio, which does a lot more trauma trauma-related research and directed energy. Um, and then the three NAMRUs, um, which are the infectious disease labs in Singapore. Um, it says Egypt, they've now moved to Sicily and, and um, Lima, Peru. So they're on the, like, the forefronts in proximity to, to the uh, infectious disease outbreak. And uh, after the past year and a half now, um, I, I think everybody knows the importance of that. Actually, if everybody remembers H1N1, um, it was actually uh, our uh, Operational Infectious Disease Laboratory that discovered H1N1 back in uh, 20, uh, 2009. So, um, so there's that pieces. So in, in my directorate, we have two departments, uh, and we're the Operational Readiness and Health Directorate, uh, where we have the two departments. Warfighter Performance, I kind of alluded to before, where we have three primary missions. Um, physical, cognitive, psychological performance. Um, injury prevention, and then, of course, the injury mitigation. Um, and in that, you know, we also have our psych psychological teams that are looking at the intrinsic factors that mediate outcomes. Sleep and fatigue, we have a robust sleep and fatigue, which if anybody's been, uh, follow follows me on Twitter, they've been seeing uh, all the posts from military.com and Stars and Stripes about all the work that we're doing uh, on board ships. So we do a lot of shipboard uh, and field-based research. Um, and then, of course, we, you know, we have also had the environmental factors. So we have a robust environmental uh, environmental physiology uh, team and laboratory. Uh, we have a non barrack uh, thermal chamber uh, where we're able to do some unique things. Uh, swim flume that we're able to, you know, increase and and reduce the temperature. And then, like we're also doing collections up in uh, in the Mountain Warfare Training Center in Bridgeport, California, where we have folks doing cognitive performance tasks rewarming tasks after they're sitting in like 30, 33 degree water in a pond. So, you know, it's, it's a wide gamut of, of, oh, and then developing heat tolerance curves after uh, heat injury. In our, in our other department, we have the med mod medical modeling and simulation and mission support department, which we do a lot of the establishment of burden, you know, more, think more public health, uh, epidemiology. We, we develop the, um, the AMOLs or the medical supplies required for the operational forces, uh, the knowledge, you know, recommendations for the knowledge, skills, and abilities that are required from a medical perspective. So the medical planning uh, side of the house as well. Um, and so it's a very important mission. So, and then we do a lot of cross-pollination where we have multi-AIM studies where which start with epidemiology and then go to laboratory-based, you know, and we have access to all the medical records and all the uh, different uh, databases that, that are collected. Um, so once again, it's a, it's, a great, uh, it's, it's a great resource and we do a lot of good work together. Here's a list and I'm gonna give you a copy of slides you can zoom in, but you know, we're, we are just one of many federal uh, research laboratories that you could partner, whether that be in the DOD or a little bit, or, or a little bit more broader especially when you're talking about federally funded research laboratory um, that, that are uh, out there. So once again, you know, depending on the scope and context of the, of the laboratory and the kind of work they do, um, there's lots of possibilities for teamwork. And then uh, I'd, I'd be remiss if I, if I mentioned my sister laboratory um, on the Army, and that's U.S. Arium, which is up in Natick, Massachusetts. Um, so 
if anybody uh, knows uh, uh, Rich, uh, Dr. Uh, Rich uh, Westrick, um, he's a retired uh, army, but he's he's running the uh, warfighter performance uh, um, piece up up in uh, U.S. area. So what I'm going to show you this brief clip, and and this is actually going to be especially salient um, if anybody's been watching the news after after watch after everything that's happened this week. Okay, and I'm just going to play this real quick. John, 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 I'm sorry, go ahead. Could you hear it? No, I think she was going to say that we couldn't hear it. Oh, you, you couldn't hear it? Yeah. Oh, oh no. All right. Well, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to narrate, I'm going to narrate it then. So essentially, these two Marines. This is actually uh, one um, B battalion, one nine, right? And basically, this is in Iraq. A, a suicide bomber came out, came towards them, loaded with explosives. And these two Marines basically lost their lives. Not not these guys, but the ones that they showed in the picture, because they were men in the post. And the, the moral of the story is that it took them, it took three seconds for them to look at the. That look at the threat that was coming in, okay? Um, as, the, as the truck was coming in, they had to make a decision to apply force. They had to have the skills to, to see the target, engage the target, okay? And this was all within three seconds, which is not that long, okay? Um, and as a result, you know, now, unfortunately, in Iraq, these two Marines died. They were awarded the Civil Star, uh, for their valor, um, but they saved basically their whole battalion. And this is the same battalion I deployed with in 2010 with the 24th Mew, which, which was actually the same uh, unit that was hit yesterday um, in Afghanistan. So I, I think it's timely that if we're thinking about from, you know, whether you're talking about the injury mitigation perspective, if you're able to get that Marine um, and get them you know, to, to more effectively rehab their knee, okay? You know, from the flip side, so left the boom, you know, the ability to take a Marine and make them, you know, improve their, their physical ability, their cognitive ability, their psychological ability from the warfighter performance perspective. If I'm able to give them back 500 milliseconds, okay? 500 milliseconds is the difference between life and death or the life and death of their whole battalion that was sleeping in the barracks not too far from the gate. Because I, I guarantee that's, that was the intent, no different than Beirut, which was also uh, the 24th meal back in uh, 82, where you know a, a truck was coming in, okay, and was gonna detonate and, and kill a, a lot of people. So you know, when you think about like what motivates me as, as a military scientist, on why I do what I do and why I think it, it's not just like, you know, helping, you know, somebody get back to tennis, which I, it's important, right? But the, the context of why we do and how we do it, okay, is, 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 you know, so important to making sure that these guys come back safe, guys and gals uh, come back safely. And, and, that, and that's, the, that's the, you know, the motivating factor between uh, this. So, at this point, I'm going to conclude the uh, the talk. I am on social media, okay, uh, at Navy PT, and this is my orchid. So you could actually kind of get a, uh, my background, where where you know what kind of work I've been doing, what I'm currently funded to do, and, and that may spur some future questions uh, as you go down the line. But without without uh, 
Without further ado, I, oh, and by the way, this is beautiful Point Loma, and our lab is right on the, uh, right up here on the point um, of Point Loma. So, um, you know, without that, I am going to stop sharing and open it up for, uh, I, I, I touched on a lot. Of, I wanted to give you an overview. I'm going to archive these slides and I'll send you the DOI. And of course, you're going to have the video. Um, but I do want to open it up for uh, questions. Um, and hopefully I, 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 I captured everything uh, accurately. And then uh, was there any pieces that, that were unclear? All right, I think we're safe. Can you all hear me? I can hear you. Okay, I didn't want the volume in the conference room that we're all in to go nuts again, like you did a second ago. Um, I I think you absolutely covered maybe more than what most of us even thought um, was involved in the process. Um, and I think one of the more striking pieces was understanding yes we we all here read the call know what you're applying for <laughs> and like you said we we tell our students that all the time um, and even the grad students that are on here that teach their own courses they tell their students that <laughs> as well um, but I think if you if you could elaborate maybe a little more on which of those areas the R1 R2 all of those that you think might fit or I'm probably already messing that up um whatever the numbers are that apply to what might make the most sense for our areas of where we could partner and the calls we should really keep our eye out for sure so th there's a they, they won't call that in the call because remember you know not a lot of people know like six one through six that I was I was that was like a lot of information and they will use you know verbatim of the scope and the intent within the call. And actually you'll oftentimes have it in the title. The, you know, the psychological, I mean the um, traumatic brain injury and psychological uh, injury, um, applied research award, uh, clinical trial award. So they will contextualize and, and, and frame it. And, you know, I would actually, if you're thinking about applying, I'd probably read all three. You know, and there's actually uh, summaries. If you go to uh, if you go to grants.gov and you click on the link, you'll actually have a list of uh, summaries. You know, there'll be a summary, and then you have the full call, and that will help to parse out, like you know, is that applicable for what you're thinking? And then you're able to read the whole call uh, to kind of delve into the weeds. Okay, but the we I'm telling you, from an attention to detail perspective get into the weeds, read it, read it twice, have the second person read it and see if you guys concur. All right. Because, you know, and, oh, and then there's, you know, there's also historical knowledge where if you guys are thinking about like, especially if we're partnering, right. You know, obviously our folks have, have executed on many of these types of, so, you know, on these types of calls. So, you know, partnering with somebody who has actually applied and been funded is, is helpful, right? You know, to kind of contextualize or even talking, uh, you know, talking through some, some possibilities. Does that answer the question? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's okay. the voice of Dr. <laughs> I <didn't> Mangum. Wait. <laughs> I went too, I got too fast on the unmute. Um, and I have another quick question. I don't want to ask everything because I'm sure other people have questions too but um, I know and as most people here are familiar with using an IH reporter tool and using that to go and look up who's funded with what when and looking up all the information what mechanism is there a mechanism to be able to easily do that with past DOD funding sure yeah if you go to CDMRP website they actually have for each of the prior they actually have the call and who was funded, you know, before, um, you know, in, in each of the respective areas, you know, and then when in doubt, you know, pick up the phone and, and talk to the, uh, talk to the program managers for, for, for the calls. You know, um, I, I think for the most part, you know, they're, they're, you know, I think depending on which organization, 
um, they're more responsive. But for the most part, if you have like, you know, finite questions, um, I think that's what they're there for is to interface with potential performers and, and getting clarification, even if something is unclear in the call. Um, you know, oftentimes the, the, uh, the, the, the program managers are there to answer those, those questions. Great. Um, anyone else questions for Dr. Frazier? Yes, thank you, Dr. Magnum. Uh, Dr. Frazier, this is Marisa Burnett. Thank you very much uh, for the excellent information. I had a question. I'm curious, when you were showing the CDMRP funding and said that there was uh, no funding on there for any musculoskeletal, um, which I found very interesting since it's one of the, it's, it is the number one uh, impediment to physical readiness. Um, yes. So I'm curious as to, like, in that instance, obviously, sprains and strains are the number one reason for lost work days within the Navy and the Marine Corps. So how, how does that funding then uh, get put on the CDMRP? Or what's the process for that? So, so that is all driven based on the priorities. And, and the other thing, the other contextualizing factor you have to think about is what is currently being executed. I, I know right now that we have a lot of musculoskeletal uh, research being funded through different, and remember the CDMRP is just the one mechanism. Okay, that's the one. Uh, there are multiple mechanisms within like the Defense Medical Research Program. Um, you have the joint plan. I didn't even go down the realm of the, the joint planning committees, right? Joint planning committee five, which funds musculoskeletal research. That is exclusively, you know, musculoskeletal uh, funded research. Once again, different time, different call. I, I wanted to bring up, you know, the grants like of is, is, should be your single, single point to see what is being funded. Um, I know typically the calls come out in December. It, and I can't remember which, which, yeah, typically around December time frame, I know we're typically sc scrambling to get either pre-proposals in. Um, but you know, that's that's one uh, that's another mechanism. So there's multiple mechanisms beyond just the CDMRP special interest funding that that are in the defense uh, uh, defense uh, research program. Great, thank you. I kind of answer your question without answering your question, but it's the the answer is bro much broader. So. All right. Everybody's excited. They're going to be applying for DOD grants. All right. Any other questions? All right. So um, if there's no other specific questions or content related questions for um, Dr. Frazier, one of the things that we wanted to try was for, I see a lot of student names have their cameras off. So if they don't mind being, uh, they don't, if they don't mind uh, cameras on, I thought it might be fun for all non-students to log off now. And then for there just to be some with Dr. Frazier about kind of all things student life. Maybe I'm in the X of my PhD or DPT program and I'm thinking about this. And so really to sort of open this up and, and turn it over to students um, and get us sort of old timers out of here. So um, that's the plan. Uh, Ryan Gert, so I'm gonna go ahead and make you, make you host, buddy, which may be a bad decision on my part, but I'm gonna make you host and then all of us faculty are gonna log off. Dr. Frazier, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. We all really appreciate it. This, is a, this has been spectacular. Um, and certainly, hopefully, there's um, another opportunity for you to come down and hang out, and we'll take you to Disney and show you a good time. Hey, I really appreciate it. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, Perfect. yeah. But my but my pleasure. And then, like I said, um, I'll I'll be uh, 
I'll archive these slides um, and I'll, I'll send you guys the uh, the DOI um, after that. Um, but yeah, um, ha happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the invite. Sorry, our audio is off. Did you have one more thing for me or us? No. Oh, did did you did you guys hear me or no? I did, I couldn't hear you over here. We have all sorts of audio problems. Faculty. No, I, I was videos, saying I, I, I said I I said I really appreciate the uh, the invite once again. Uh, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure, yeah. and um, I'll I'll archive these uh, slides. Uh, provide you guys with the DOI and. Um, yeah, I, I and I you said you guys are going to archive it on uh, YouTube, yes. so uh, yeah. if you could just shoot me that link, uh, absolutely I'll integrate that together. So, but I've yeah, already no, I've, I've already tweeted how awesome this was. So, <laughs> oh, awesome! <laughs> You've already got a tag. Yeah. All right, awesome! I really appreciate right. it. Thanks, buddy. We appreciate it. Bye, bye. We'll take care, guys. Bye.